Today, our focus uh, for our panel discussions will be learnings from implementation of temporary special measures and reflections on what can be improved. Participants will learn about temporary special measures in PNG and reflections on how they can be improved. Our moderator for today, Ms. Dalciana Somare Brash, has over 20 years development experience. She's currently a senior minister, ministerial advisor, policy and engagement lead in the office of the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Commerce and Industry. From 2017, Dalciana was one of Pangu Party's key strategic policy advisors in the lead up to the success of that political party in the 2017 general elections. She contested the 2017 national elections in the East Sipic regional seat. Dalciana is a consultant, consulting technical advisor to the Asian Development Bank in PNG on environmental and social safeguard policies, and more recently, an independent evaluation mission to revalidate ADB's overall country strategy for PNG. She's an experienced, experienced technical advisor to the Mumeng local level government in the Bulolo district, Morabe province. This gives her proximity to key subnational fiscal and social economic issues in major extractive projects such as Wafi Gopu and the smaller Hidden Valley gold and copper mines. Dalciana is focused on customary land issues, benefit sharing for landowners, and resettlement issues for development in other major extractive projects in PNG. Dalciana is a key policy interlocutor between national politicians and key private sector leaders, development partners, and civil society. Dalciana was once an ABC Radio Australia journalist and the Deputy Executive Director of the Pacific Institute of Public Policy, a regional public policy think tank. She has an innate understanding of subnational institutional experience in, experiences in reform, policy, and legislation. She is a trained political scientist with a legal background. Dalciana Somara Brash is a wife and mother of two daughters. Our other panelists include Ms. Samantha Tutti. She's a member of the Women's Rights Action Movement, WRAM Solomon Islands, a non-government organization of motivated women and men who believe in the cause for gender equality. The WRAM founders saw a need to effectively and consistently remind government of gender issues in the country and its commitments to address these issues, focusing focusing on the need to reform laws and policies. WRAM's focus areas are promoting women in decision-making and leadership, eliminating violence against women and women's economic empowerment. Ms. Teresa Mecki is a PhD ca candidate with the Department of Pacific Affairs at ANU Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. Teresa's research focuses on women's participation in Papua New Guinea's national politics. She's interested in elections and women's political representation in Melanesian more broadly. The, Teresa's PhD research explores the gendered nature of campaigning in Papua New Guinea's 2017 national election. Prior to commencing her candidature in DPA in 2014, Teresa worked as a field producer and research assistant for the DFAT-funded Power Mary Film Project, a partnership between Victoria University, Melbourne, and the University of Goroka in Papua New Guinea. Ms. Mayor Lo Isaac is the commissioner of the Motoko Koitabu Assembly. Honorable Mayor Lo Isaac is the commissioner of the Motokoitabu Assembly. She was successfully elected women's representative for the West Motokoitabu West Assembly in 2018. She was appointed a board member of the National Capital District Commission in 2019. Before establishing her own training and consulting services, Mayor was former human resources manager for Lamana Hotel. She trained as a secretary and established the Association of Administrative Professionals in 1997. It was Honorable Mayor's desire to see change in her community that inspired her to run for election. Dr. Alphonse Gelu has held the position of Registrar of the Office of Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates Commission since 2012. 
Dr. Gelu was a lecturer of political science, specifically in comparative politics, political theory, and public administration at the University of Papua New Guinea from 1989 to 2006. He then joined the National Research Institute as a senior research fellow with the Politics and Legal Studies Division. Dr. Gelu has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Public Administration from UPNG, a Master's in Arts Political Science from Ohio University in USA, and a PhD in Political Science from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Dr. Eric Kwa was appointed Attorney General of Papua New Guinea in December 2020. In November 2018, he was appointed the Secretary of the Department of Justice and Attorney General of Papua New Guinea. He currently holds both positions. Dr. Kwa formerly held the posts of Secretary and Chief Executive Officer of the Papua New Guinea Constitu Constitutional and Law Reform Commission, Professor of Law at the University of Papua New Guinea, and a former Dean of the Law School. Dr. Kwa holds a PhD in Environmental Law from the Auckland University, New Zealand, a Master of Laws with Honours in Environmental Law from Wollongong University, Australia, and a law degree with honors from the University of Papua New Guinea. He has researched and published widely in the field of law. The government of Papua New Guinea awarded him the Scholar Kakas Award in 2015 in recognition of his efforts in supporting and promoting the women of Papua New Guinea. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dalsiana Samaria Brash, and I'm the moderator today. In the interest of time, we'll get straight into it. I understand that. Uh, Dr. Kwa has a very limited uh, amount of time with us here uh, this morning. So, uh, Dr. Kwa, uh, in terms of women's leadership and decision-making and correcting gender imbalances as per the intent of the mechanisms such as uh, temporary, the temporary special measures, where does PNG stand, uh, number one? Uh, from a legal perspective, how well are we as women uh, given voice and protected as a demographic that represents more than 50% of the entire population of this country. And sorry, Doctor, I'm asking you about three questions, if that's all right. Um, the politics of Papua New Guinea takes place in a framework of a parliamentary, representative, de democratic, multi-system, multi-party system, whereby the Prime Minister is the head of government and legislative power is vested in both the government and parliament. Under this premise, would you agree that it is unjust for half of our country's population not to be represented in the legislature or the executive government? Dr. Kwa. Uh, thank you, Dalsena. Uh, first of all, let me say that um, in terms of our political representation, let's not forget that at the local level level, local government level, we do have uh, women representatives in the local government. Secondly, we also have women representatives in the provincial assembly. Whether they're effective or not is another issue. But the fact is that we have women leaders who sit in these two levels of government. We also have the classic example of Motu Kwetabu and also the Bougainville experience. So as a country, we have done something positive. It's at the parliamentary level that we have an issue. And that's the focus of many of the discussions that we have been having in the last probably 20 years. How to get our women uh, into the national parliament. Since 1995, we have had women leaders at the world level, to LLG, and to provincial government. Now, when you compare the landscape, we have done poorly in terms of <coughs> women representation in the national parliament. We thought we would succeed in 2012 when we got three women in, but then by 2017, they faded away. And so obviously it shows us that there's a really big problem that uh, we have in this country. And so the observation by Ms. Fario is on point. We, we don't dispute that. So on the scale in the re regional level, we have done poorly. At the international level, we've done poorly in the national parliament. Let me just qualified at, at the national parliament. That is the reason why, as Mary told us, the government has taken several steps to try and rectify the problem. So we tried it in 2009. We didn't succeed. 
2011, we did succeed, but halfway. I always tell people that we did succeed because the constitution was amended. Section 101 was amended to create 24 provincial seats for women. What we did succeed was the amending the organic law elections to ensure that the women got elected through the election, electoral process. But by law, the constitution was changed in 2011. We have now tried our third attempt under the leadership of um, Honorable Prime Minister James Marape. Well, we didn't start in 2017, um, Mary. We only started last year. Uh, last year, we think it was uh, prompted by the visit by the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, a, a woman who came across to PNG and um, she had a frank discussions with our political leaders. And our political leaders at the time agreed that we can try and push for women uh, representatives in the parliament in the coming elections. So the bureaucracy was given a task to put together a proposal. And we tasked the registry of political parties to lead us in putting together a proposal to cabinet. So Dr. Gelu and his team did put together a document that came across to the bureaucracy. Uh, we looked at it and we, we agreed and we pushed it through the system. Uh, but last year, the government did not agree uh, to the formatting of the proposal, so they asked us to redo it. So we did take it back, and uh, we looked at it at the bureaucratic level um, with the leadership of Dr. Gelo. And we have now got a new submission back to cabinet. So in May, the cabinet did agree. There is a decision by cabinet that we will have five regional seats for women come 2022. Just one or two conditions of that decision, which are being managed by the bureaucrats. One is on uh, consultations. The government wants to be convinced that we did consult everybody, that everybody does agree to the five, five seats. They also think that our political leaders must also be consulted because the proposal came from the prime minister himself and it went through. And so those are the two conditions that we are still working on to try and get uh, approval by cabinet so that we can now push for uh, constitutional change. So at the political level, we have taken the decision. The government has taken the decision. We are now trying to see how we can be able to progress it. So in the context of the legal framework, there is law that provides for women representation in parliament, but we couldn't complete it. In terms of the political will at the moment, the current government wants to see five regional seats for women in 2022. A decision has been made, except that we need to just meet those two small conditions. And so we are working around the clock to try and get some decision so that we can go back to cabinet to get an approval so that we can change the constitution. Now, as I speak, you must understand that um, parliament actually rises in April because that's when the reach opened. And so the time frame from now to April, uh, it's quite difficult, but we'll try our best to see uh, how far we can go ahead in terms of implementing the government decision to create the five regional seats. It's based on the um, side of the Samoan model because it does not uh, depend on the numbers. What it does is it provides the minimum, minimum number of women that must go into parliament. That's five. And so the country has been divided into five regions. And I'm like somewhere where if you have one in, then you go for a four to be appointed amongst the women with the highest number of votes. In PNG, women will still be eligible to um, raise in the provincial seats and the open electorates. But this one provides a basic minimum that in every parliament, there'll be five women in, in parliament uh, representing uh, our people. The voting and everything, similar to the, the normal voting process. Uh, LPV, men and women voting, when they get elected, they have the same rights and privileges as a member of parliament. So everything is normal, but it's just that we're gonna break up into five different uh, regions. We do not want to call it TSM, we, we want to just make it as a permanent picture and at a given point in time, 
then let the parliament decide whether they would like to get rid of the five, five seats or readjust. So, you know, temporary special measures, there's always a sunset clause. Uh, we would like to think that we allow the events of the future to take its course and then they can, the country can decide at a given point whether they would want to keep the uh, five, five seats. But apart from that, uh, Dalciana, I think um, the legal process framework is in place, the political will is there. We're just fighting against time at the moment. I'm just really fighting against time to see if we can at least get a decision and see if we can get, get it across the line. I can assure you that um, a lot of the international partners, our donors are all ready to support us to roll it out once the decision is confirmed and we, we get things done. We are already in the process of developing the drafts, draft amendments to the constitution if the cabinet finally says go. And we also got, uh, we also got our government lawyers working around developing a, a, a law to give effect to the change when it come, once it comes. So really, I think um, we're at a point in time where the current government is unfortunately came in two years late, but they are interested, they're supportive, they want to get women in. Uh, the law is there, and I think the support from the public and the bureaucracy, we're all behind the current decision to have five regional seats um, by next year. Thank you. Dr. Carr, thank you very much for that update and thank you for the correction as well on, on um, the local level uh, representation that exists already. That is a separate election from the national parliamentary election and should actually be staged uh, at the same time, I understand, uh, at law. Uh, thank you for, um, I think this is probably a good segue now to go into uh, to, to ask you uh, the question, um, Honourable uh, Mayor Low Isaac, um, the and 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 particularly on the importance of of the existing provisions under under the MKA Act, that that allowed for um, your your ascension to become uh, a commissioner within within the Motokoita Assembly, um, the laws provide for women's representation in the MKA. Please share your recent experience and the value of this crucial temporary measure that means that women are compulsorily represented uh, in the assembly and in, in, in your indigenous group representation. Thank you, um, everyone. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here and I'd like to thank uh, Pacific Women for um, the honor of having me participate in this panel. The representation, um, just a correction, I am a commissioner with the National Capital District Board and also uh, I'm a member of the Motukoita Assembly uh, representing women in the West constituency whereas I look after three villages which is Hanobara, Tatana and Baruni. I was elected in 2018 and the TSM allowed that Unfortunately, it was only women that could vote. And I found that um, having to go in there and only women voting, I thought it wasn't fair because women represent both men and women and they also represent the children. So it would be fair and just for us women also to be voted by the men as well, not just women, because we're a family. And uh, going in there with the TSM, it has practically helped. I, I believe with um, the Motukoita people, we, um, the cultural barriers are not there. But with uh, the other societies and the other provinces throughout Papua New Guinea, we have a cultural barrier that does not allow women to be in um, certain leadership uh, or decision-making bodies, which we have talked about. I've been around with... Uh, the uh, UN women traveling to uh, advocate for the five regional seats uh, in, in the Highlands region, Momasa region, and just returned from the New Guinea Islands uh, region two weeks ago. And this came out really strong that we, the cultural barriers is one of the, bar um, cultural traditions or values is one of the barriers of women getting into parliament, especially in the national level, and also the financial capacity and the um, women are not recognized by political parties to be able to be nominated and endorsed 
to become, uh, to run for politics within the national level. And I, I believe if we can, these are the three major issues, and if we be able to overcome these issues, the financial capacity, the political um, endorsement, and also one of the other major hurdles is especially women ourselves. So hopefully we can get around that. Um, we really don't want to see another woman getting on top of the other one. And as soon as one gets up there, we... That's why I saw this in the, the recent Motu, uh, the recent Mosby Northwest elections. Hanovada women got together and they all went for Lohia Boy Samuel. Now, this is a male. But if we had to try to mobilize women to go and vote for a woman, it's just not going to happen for whatever reason. And the only reason I can see is just pure petty jealousy or pure petty... Um, you just don't want to see another woman raise and be excelled to another level. It's just so sad. And it's not happening only in the Motokoita. It's happening throughout the entire... Um, nation in Papua New Guinea as a whole because I, I heard that in the uh, Highlands region, I heard it also in the um, Momasa region and, and also in the New Guinea Islands region. So we need to stop this petty jealousy and get women into parliament. With the backing of the Prime Minister of the five regional seats, this is a good opportunity for us to take it on board. And if we don't and if we still want the 22 reserve seats, it's just not going to happen. So the five regional seats, um, thank you, Dr. Kwa, and also Dr. Gelu was with us uh, throughout the um, regional visits, and he explained on the uh, political party's uh, endorsement role that they can play to get women into parliament. Thank you, Mayor. Um, some very important points there on um, the cultural barriers, but also the... Um, internal differences that I think we face as in, in different demographics. We'll go to one of our online panellists now. Um, uh, I, think, I think this is an important um, point, um, at an important point to, um, to speak to Ms. Theresa Mekki, who's a PhD candidate with the Department of uh, Pacific Affairs at the ANU Coral Bell School of uh, Asia Pacific Affairs. Um, your research focuses on women's presence and vote share in PNG's election history. I contested the 2017 elections for the East Pacific Regional seat and I came fourth, so I have my own very strong views on, on my experience at the polls, but I'm curious about the research and the academic perspectives on the obstacles we faced with, uh, we were faced with as women in the 2017 national elections. Teresa. Thank you, Dalciana. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. So the 2017 election, um, before going into that election, I was at a women's conference, the very first one in 2015 that was held by, um, funded by the US Department of State, um, US Embassy and the Department of Community Development. So there was the strong sentiment that uh, women didn't need um, TSM, but they could just keep going and the sentiment that came out from one of the sessions was that just keep competing, keep trying, and eventually you get there. Um, so I went and observed uh, 2017 elections and stayed 10 months on site leading up to the elections. Um, so what I want to refute is that this idea of persistence, that if you come, I don't know, seventh, then you try again, you'll come fifth, then you try again, you'll come third, and eventually um, you'll win. So what we found is that um, there is research on the type of women who win, but there is not so much as a pathway to success. So notwithstanding the amount of resources, the access to networking and campaign methods, and even the candidates' um, credibility, winning depends on the, to a large extent on the context of the election, uh, the administration, the, incumbent, the pool of fellow candidates um, competing with the women, the local politics, and of course, the voting culture of that particular electorate. Uh, we see that exemplified in 2012 with Delilah Gora's case. The Sohe voters, they're very conscientious and there were very little block voting in that election and that may, contributed to her win. Also with um, persistence, uh, we can say that it builds the candidate's popularity, but it might not be a practical strategy for women contesting in 
um, in expensive electoral environments such as PNG. When we look at Julie Soso and um, Luzaya Kuza, who are the examples of women winners who are regular contestants, their persistence was beneficial in building their popularity and experience as candidate. However, there are many other regular contesting women candidates who have not succeeded in either being elected or building competitiveness over time. An example is candidate Margaret Local, who has been contesting for Mosby South and the NCDC since 1982, and she still hasn't won. Her best result was in 1992 when she finished fifth in the NCD seat. Um, in 2017, she contested again for the same seat and she finished in 18 in the field of 38 candidates. So um, when women, if we keep saying, keep persisting and keep contesting, if women were to campaign exactly like how men campaign, that's, the, that's how in, in the absence of any TSM, that's, that's the message that's coming across. You gotta campaign exactly like men. Now that entails starting very early, even two years prior with your groundwork, establishing a committee, showing Luxave, creating Hanmark in your electorate, building alliances, and then spending large amounts of resources and money. And not, not every woman candidate can do that. That is, that, that's too much expenses. And that's just not with the, um, with the regular formal eight weeks of campaigning, but this I'm talking about the months and years prior to elections, because the concept of reciprocity is very strong in PNG and, and other Melanesian countries. They think of what you've done for them before and that acts as, um, you know, you've done something for me, so I'll vote for you now. So that type of preparation, if you take into account, it's very um, expensive. So it is not enough to um, encourage women to keep trying and to get in because they are not the problem as such. It is the structures and the institutions in which they operate. Um, so to effectively increase women's representation in a sustainable way, we really have to understand the gendered nature of the political dynamics that, um, that occurs during elections, even before um, all the politicking that goes on during campaigning and prior to that. Um, and that's a lot of things to take on for a woman candidate and given the time frame that she has to prepare for. Um, that's all I can say at the moment and we can add a bit later. I'm just aware of the time. Thank you, Dalshiana. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, thank you, uh, Teresa, for, for your um, insight into your research and important uh, questions and issues around, you know, the entry point for, for candidates, just candidates in general. Um, the, uh, um, I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Gelunel um, as a registrar um, of, of the uh, Commission of uh, Integrity of Political Parties. Um, Dr. Gelu, as to the point that Teresa has just made about um, the, I guess the, the the disparity or the or the the difficulty with entry level for women in competing in 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 elections, um, have there been in the past, um, or has there been in the past um, a reform pathway that caps, um, you know, the the the, the size of um, electoral support, uh, resourcing and financing that that may lead to more you know equality in terms of of the entry level of, of, I guess, expenditure at elections. That's one question, um, Doctor, which I probably haven't framed that well, but I think you know what I'm saying. Um, and also, um, Dr. Geller, would you please describe a realistic and urgent reform pathway that will strengthen gender um, equality, legis uh, gender equality legislation in the context of the upcoming polls in 2022? Or does the organic law on the integrity of political parties and other relevant legislation support gender equality as a legal obligation? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Dalsiana, and uh, thank you everyone for, for your part in, in this. Uh, in terms of the support that goes to the women candidates, and I think this is one of those issues that we've been, we've been talking about, and I think some, some groups have raised this issue, uh, that women should be, should be assisted in fact, the organic law and the integrity of political parties and candidates allows for uh, contributions to be made into the central fund, which is managed by the registry, and the funding can then be used to assist uh, our women candidates in Papua New Guinea. So far, we haven't received any assistance as yet from outside or from within uh, the country. There were some discussions initially on this, 
but it never went through. <clears throat> but campaign finance is one of those biggest issues, and I think this relates to the whole idea about the living playing field uh, in, in, in Papua New Guinea elections. And I think the current um, scenario is that it's very uneven. It's very uneven, especially for the woman, uh, if you compare this with the, the men. And I think Teresa was talking about um, you know, preparations for the 2022 election. For some candidates, and mostly men, they have started since 2017. And women cannot be put into that same category as those ones that have already started the race. So it is quite a, a, a difficult situation for a woman. Uh, in terms of contributions that can be made to women candidates, uh, that, that can be made. Only candidates are eligible for some kind of um, help from whatever contributions, either it's from corporate contributions or from uh, individual uh, contributions or support. But most of the, the contributions that are made and which are disclosed to my office are mostly for men and for political parties. And we've had instances where contributions that are made goes into the account of the party leader who then does not use it to support candidates within his party. So that's one of those issues that we are, we are looking at. Uh, for the registry of political parties, we have come to realize this, and we've been working uh, hard in terms of uh, uh, trying to, to, to address the situation of our women, uh, especially women candidates in elections. And it is through the, the organic law that we've, we've tried to come up with some, some changes. In fact, Dr. Kwa has worked with us since uh, 2012, 2013 in putting together a, um, a revised organic law. In that revised organic law, what we have decided to insert is a provision on a quota system, a quota that will help women, especially for political parties that endorse uh, candidates, that 20% of those women, uh, candidates must be women. So that is one of those uh, uh, initiatives that we've come up with. Unfortunately, it is part of the revised organic law. It is now in parliament, but again, like what Dr. Kwe said, uh, the time now is not really on our side. And you know, it will be a great disappointment because this, this change was proposed back in 2013, and yet parliament did not pass it from 2013 to 2017, and now it's 2017 to 2022. And for us at the registry, we are quite concerned about this. You know, this is a law, it is a law for the country, it's not a law for any individual, but it would go a long way. Uh, but for us at the registry, we played our part by continuously encouraging political parties to support women candidates. In fact, uh, on Thursday and Friday this week, we'll be having a workshop, uh, specifically talking to our party executives again, that, you know, come 2022, you need to give you now more focus to our women. Uh, there is also a mentoring program that we are running. In fact, from the provincial level, we've completed almost all the provinces. Uh, it's only Central, NCD, and Gulf, Ella, and Southern Islands to go. But in those mentoring programs, we've encouraged our women to start telling us about which political party they want to, to be part of. In fact, from the provincial visits, we are now not going to go into the regional uh, visits, which we will start in September, in next month. And at those uh, forums that we will be having in September, we will bring along with us party executives. And it will not be the 46 political parties. It will be those political parties that we think are serious in supporting our women candidates. So we will bring them together and they will talk to the women face to face. And the women will tell them that I want to join your party, I want you to support me. So that is one of those things that we are trying to do <clears throat> uh, before 2022. And to get more women to become uh, you know, members of political parties, but at the same time to get more women candidates to be endorsed by political parties. So those are some of those things that we're trying to do. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, we are running out of time, but we're trying to do it before uh, 2022. Dr. Gillow, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd uh, like to go into, uh, I guess, the notion of political will that both Dr. Kwa and, and Dr. Gillow have, have touched on. Um, um, to look at um, a sub-regional experience in, in Solomon Islands. Um, so, Ms. Samantha Tutti is a women's rights movement uh, RAM advocate in the Solomon Islands. 
as to the question of uh, political will, uh, Samantha, if you could um, perhaps touch on a little bit about the importance of political will in ensuring that that uh, representation uh, of women in, in, in parliament in your country was able to be facilitated under very similar uh, cultural uh, contexts and, and if you could just speak to the issue of, I guess, the frameworks, the enabling environment that made it possible for, for um, representation. I understand there are members, uh, female members of parliament uh, in the Solomon Islands. Samantha. Sorry, we've just got a problem with the sound. Yeah, are you, Samantha, have you unmuted? I think I have, yes. Thank you, we can hear you now, Samantha. Go ahead, please. Thank you. All right, um, it's afternoon here, so good afternoon from um, Honiara. Um, just, just to go to the... Um, to the gist of the question about the political will to drive these uh, policy changes on the ground here. I guess when the other speakers were talking, I can really relate uh, to the challenges that are faced in PNG. They are very similar or the same to the ones that we are facing here in, in Solomon Islands. So really our campaign started in 2007 um, and then it got out of parliament in 2009. And there was like really little progress um, from then until 2017. Um, and the drive that enables um, the TSM policy to come back into, I guess, into government's priority is really the political will actually came from the Western Provincial Government. So the, um, the TSM agenda that we are advocating for now is not at the national level, because we have tried at the national level already and it's been shut down. So the one that we are advocating for now is really at the provincial level. So the drive that you know pushed this um, TSM agenda to come back into government's priority is really a call from uh, Western provincial government that they are supporting women to be part of the government and they are looking at ways of how this can be formally integrated. And that's where RAM came into the picture and RAM almost like jumped yeah, at this entry point and uh, forming a partnership with the Ministry of Women. Uh, to enable that to happen. Um, and so in order to assess and say, yes, there is really political will at the provincial level for TSM for um, women representation in the provincial government, we had to undertake a lot of work. And so we had been able to visit the nine provinces that we had to get the endorsements on whether they would like women to be part of the provincial government or not. And that has been a really, really robust and um, consultative process. It has, you know, it has um, given us a lot of um, drive, but also there's a lot of positiveness coming from the provincial government uh, saying that, of course, they would like women to be part of the decision making process. So, out of the nine provinces that have been consulted, Six of them have endorsed through an executive paper um, saying that they want that. Um, but before we start, there was also the um, conclusions from CEDO, um, really at the beginning to say that nobody knows about TSM. TSM is really a new concept. Um, you know, if you want to get the drive from the public, from the communities, uh, from the public sector, uh, from the decision makers, there has to be like a mass kind of um, awareness raising almost for the population. So the 
you know, when we when we went out to to look at how the provincial governments respond, they said yes, uh, but they they are. Uh, you know, they represent wards, and whether the wards are willing, that's a different story. But from the heads representing the wards, they say, yes, we, we would like women to be part of it. So RAM, um, as a organization, also has been engaging with other women agencies to look at how awareness raising can be done more effectively. Um, and I, I was relating to one of the speakers talking about the mentoring program. We have been able to execute some mentoring program, but also looking at how we can build like the women's movement to engage on the issue of TSM and to, to ask for it, to talk about it um, willingly um, and noting that you know, it's, it's, a long, it's a long process but how can we educate at least many, many people as possible about TSM? So the strategies that we use with the provincial governments are really awareness raising, saying to them that, you know, this is a concept that has been floated about in 2009, has been shut down. Uh, we are coming back with it. This is from, like, it's been, um, it's wanted by the Western provincial government. So what are your views? And then we had to, to, we had come to a, a stumbling block where we realized that the Provincial Government Act has to be revised to include the TSM provision. So this is a journey. So I guess for us, our lessons too is that, you know, as we go, it's a really iterative process. We, we go, we had this thing in mind, and then we realized, all right, we have to step back and include another dimension that we have forgotten. So we kind of started off with just the awareness raising and then slowly we scope out the different models that are used in TSM now. And then, you know, for it to be effective, the provincial government act really, the revised one has to be passed in our parliament and the provincial government, once they're ready, they have to develop an ordinance uh, to enact it. So, Yes, I guess in terms of the political will to, to push that agenda, we kind of have it now. And so we are, we are utilizing while we have it. Thank you, Samantha. Um, thank you for the insight into um, the uh, sub-regional uh, perspective and, and, and and I guess placing the emphasis on um, getting the traction where the support was in, in, in relation to uh, provincial support um, for, for an agenda that requires ongoing uh, awareness. I think that's a theme now that's coming through very clearly um, with, with, with every, every one of our speakers here today. I do want to go back to the question of the five reserve seats and the importance of the limited time that we have left. Parliament will be in session on the 10th of August. Um, and I guess the passage of, of all, all related legislation and the importance of the p political will um, and the timing to the next election. Um, I, I, I think we, we have a responsibility to actually flesh out this conversation about as to whether or not are we going to get the support? Is the appetite there uh, for, for support uh, by 111 members, or at least a, a, a majority. What's required on the floor to, for the for the passage of these uh, bills, Dr. Gallo? If you can give us an impression, please. Thank you. Uh, it's it's that's a very interesting question. In fact, that's something that uh, Dr. Kwa and I and uh, the others that are involved in the um, at the bureaucratic level in discussing this idea, we are we are we are crumbling a bit. Uh, like I said, yeah, and Dr. Quest also mentioned this, that the time now is, uh, is not on our side, but like I said, at the bureaucratic level, we are working about on this and we are committed in trying to get this across to the, the, the political level, and that is the NEC. But I think one of the things that we must also uh, understand is the fact that um, in, terms of, in terms of the consultation that is required, and I think Dr. Quest also mentioned this, it is very, very important especially to our leaders, that our leaders must understand the, the, the whole reason 
And I think the point that our one talk from Solomon Islands uh, mentioned about uh, TSM, Temporary Special Measures, is that it, this is a kind of a new language that p people are now bringing out. In fact, in one of the forums that we had at uh, Lamana for the Southern Region for our women, uh, one of the issues that I raised was on the issues on uh, activism. That it is very important that we should not stop talking about these issues. You know, from 2011 and 12 and 13, why did we stop? Why did we, 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 we had a research until now that we are talking about these kind of issues? Uh, for us in Papua New Guinea, I think it is quite common that we, need, we have to constantly talk, talk about these issues in order to get our people to understand, but more so to get our leaders to understand this. Uh, in getting this legislation through and getting this proposed, sorry, changes through, it requires the mood. The mood has to be right in, in us getting this through the political level. So that is now our challenge, uh, uh, Dalsiana. That is our challenge right now. And for us at the bureaucratic level, like I said, we, we, we are working as to what we want this to, to go. But now it is very dependable on how it will now go to our, our leaders for them to discuss this. But I think one of the progress that we made in terms of talking with our leaders is through the, the GBV, um, uh, GBV forum, where uh, our politicians that are members of the GBV committee, parliamentary committee, uh, are quite receptive about this. And I think they are now pushing for this as well. Uh, in fact, I, I did a presentation to the committee, and Dr. Kua also did the same. And uh, the, the reaction is, is quite positive okay, at that committee level. But it is now about getting it from the community level up to the other level. And that is the challenge that we are, we are working on. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, sorry. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question of, of the uh, researcher on um, the reality of what does actually... The, the importance of having female representation in Parliament. I know that when I uh, campaigned in 2017, I had designed five district development plans. I designed a provincial uh, uh, plan, um, the delivery mechanisms, uh, understanding the importance of the differences between five local level governments that all sit inside the Pacific Provincial Assembly. Um, I, I made sure that the messaging uh, was very key. I certainly didn't have the resources that my male counterparts did um, to stand um, in those elections, but it was very exhaustive and I had a message and a plan. In your research, Teresa, um, I, I mean, beyond talking about getting the representation in Parliament um, and, and the mentoring, the importance of the mentoring that's going on, are we actually advocating very strongly for our female representatives to have an economic plan, to understand the importance of the size of the economy, to understand the importance of the direction within which our country is going, um, the structure of government, the national, local level government, the difference between a district being uh, a, a, you know, a legal entity that doesn't have the fiscal and lawmaking powers as, say, a provincial government and a local level government. Are we, what, what are you finding in your research? I... I I'm very interested to know uh, this, Teresa, and perhaps uh, May I can speak to one of the, to the issue as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dalciana. What I found very interesting during my fieldwork was that um, because I attended a lot of the women's training as well, so I saw how they developed their plan and their campaign strategy and their messaging. Um, when it comes down to the level where they go and communicate with their committee members or their campaign managers, we see that the community, uh, the committee members then take that message that the women candidate gave them, and they sort of translate it to their own language, or uh, not so much as in talk less, but how the voters would understand and how it would be perceived. So a lot of the times I see that the, our committee members, I don't know how we can best utilize them, but they do a lot of work because they're on the ground communicating with the people, and then half of the time they're educating the voters that this is the job of the member, this is what the district does, this is where the money comes from. And after all that educating, then they say, okay, then you have to vote for this person. And a lot of the times the messaging goes down to the committee members. So if, um, if you're in a society where the committee member is in a village, and I see that with the women candidates, they always use the gendered um, you know, aspects of a female candidate. They use analogies like, Oh, I'm, I'm so look at in family and, and mama, and then when she gets to parliament, she'll do that. So they bring it down back to the 
to the to the gender identity of the woman rather than the policy and the plans. And even though the woman candidate herself has communicated that with her com committee members when they translate that message, because a candidate, a woman candidate or a male candidate cannot go anywhere, like everywhere in the electorate or the district and, and do awareness. So a lot of the work is done by the committee members. So when they go out, they're communicating at that level where, you know, she did this for us at that time when you were in a heavy, that happened. So a lot of all that good messaging about um, planning and what her experience are in the field and what she's done in her career, that never really gets communicated unless she herself is talking. So um, that goes again to my point where we're looking at TSM and one aspect of, you know, equalizing this um, case of women in parliament, but then there are a whole lot of other factors in place. And as with um, Dr. Gelly was saying, the awareness has to be, the advocacy has to be consistent at the national level through mainstream media. And then we have at the village level in the schools and what does that mean? What does a, what does a leader look like? What do they do? And all of those things have to work together for this agenda to go forward. If we're just focusing on that, we still have our political culture where people look at Hanmark and reciprocity and where were you when my cousin died and all of these things come into play. So even though we're looking at one side, we still have to put our reach to other sectors as well for it to, to go forward. So I see that our committee members and people on the ground, they really have a lot of power and influence as local gatekeepers. And I don't know how the, if there's a way where we can do more research to find out how we can best utilize these key players that are that come around during election times. And, and they're all there. And I'm sure you, you, you know as well in your experience, we have these um, people in the community that are very knowledgeable and they are the, you know, the nexus between the voters and the candidate. And they're the ones communicating all that messaging and hurting the voters and doing a lot of work. So if we can um, utilize their influence, I think that that's an area that also needs to be looked at. Teresa, thank you. Um, that's a, that goes to a real question around the rules around campaigning and that period um, where, where the campaign starts. And, and is there, uh, uh, you know, so beyond just talking about getting females into, uh, onto the floor of parliament or into a provincial assembly, the importance of having um, an even playing field when we're talking about um, the actual campaign journey itself. Um, I, I've just been given a, um, a, a sign to say that we've got 10 minutes left. Dr. Kwa, there's an online uh, participant who's asking, is the intention that the five regional seats for women would be um, that would only be elected uh, by women, as pointed out in, in the Motokoita Assembly uh, scenario that, that Mayas pointed out? The five uh, women that uh, will represent the five regions will be elected by both men and women. Um, so just like every other, uh, the electorates. So open to everyone, but only women will uh, race for the seats. We're also suggesting that um, the women can also be either nominated by parties or they can run as independent. Um, I know that there's a difficulty in terms of the regions that they need to cover, but uh, let me assure you that um, we have to do one thing at a time. We really can't attend to all the different challenges that we have. For me, it's if we can take one step, and that one step is if we can just get the law across and yeah, get... Yeah the first challenge and let's see how we go. Then we can improve as we go along. Without that first step, and we start I I discussing the peripherals, we'll never get anywhere. Uh, let me just close up uh, by just making an observation about the Port Mosby Northwest elections. Um, we had one woman running uh, amongst, uh, I think, 42 candidates, 40, 40. Uh, 41 candidates. And um, when I was watching the um, tally, um, it really dawned on me that we really need to have the TSM. Because even the women will not be able to, we're, we're not able to vote the, the only woman candidate. The numbers were not even picking up at all. And so that really drives home that even uh, we can talk about, yes, women will run themselves. They, will, they, they can still be elected by the normal electoral process. Just the one election that is very recent in a very educated electorate in a city sends a very powerful signal that we need TSM. Thank you. Thank you. Again, in the interest of time, thank you, Dr. Kwa. Um, there, there's another question from an online participant, and that's to Teresa. Is there research 
about whether women and men both vote for women's seats? Is it better to shift attitudes about it being appropriate for women to be in Parliament? Teresa, that was for you. Oh, that's a really hard one. <laughs> we've we've been doing that for a while now with all the with all the um, campaigns since 2012 and before that. It's really hard to to change um, um, attitudes towards voters. There was I did this research on my honors asking about perspectives, whether asking young people. This is a, a university age from 19 to 25 if they would vote for a woman candidate, and their answers more went in line with um, if she's my auntie, I'll vote for her. If you know, if I know her, if she's a cousin and relative, so that that political culture, the culture of voting rather, is really strong. So it's not so much men and women, but it still goes down to who you know and what they've done for you. Um, and then when people think about that, the person that's most likely to provide for you, who they see as a leader, is automatically the the big man in the society or the uncle that's been providing for them. So it really goes back to the to the voting culture that's hard to change. Thank you, Teresa. Um, I think we're probably down to our last seven minutes. Um, and I'd really like to ask, um, again, um, in the interest of time, final observations um, and any, any comments from the entire panel. So maybe we'll start down the line with Dr. Gello, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think as, uh, what we've learned from uh, the discussions, uh, the short discussions of the year, it's quite a, a challenge for a woman. Uh, contesting for the elections, but you know, uh, through commitment and through um, innovation in terms of ideas or coming up with programs, I think that is the way to go. Uh, for us, the registry through these little mentoring programs that we have conducted, it's quite successful. Uh, we've picked up quite a, a good number of women that will be contesting throughout the country. Uh, and the key message that we are telling them is basically about you know being visible. You come out and you, you prepare in time. You don't wait until the issue of reach for you to tell everyone that you'll be contesting. That is already late. Okay, so that is what we are doing, you know, trying to get women out now, you know, to get women out now. There is this issue about early campaigning. This is not early campaigning. Okay, this is not early campaigning. And also one of those issues about for a woman, that the knowledge about the electorate, for whatever electorate you want to contest for, you must know the electorate from one end to the other hand, from the north to the south and south, uh, west to the east. You have to know the electorate, it is, it is very important. Uh, of course, one of the issues is about the, the nature of the conduct of elections in Papua New Guinea. This can also be a problem, and I think uh, Mary Fairio raised it about, you know, these all issues of intimidation, and violence, and whatever. But one of the things that we are really pushing for women to do is to campaign on issues. Maybe if we really campaign on, on issues, and if people can start listening to the issues that women are talking about. It might change the whole nature of how we conduct elections in Papua New Guinea. That people will start looking at issues as, and, and not on personality. One of those dominant parts of our political culture. So those are the kind of things that we are trying to do in order to address this. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gelo, thank you. Um, Dr. Kwa, there is a question here on how many uh, parliamentarians need to vote to make the change to adopt the five regional seats. Uh, thank you, Deltiana. Uh, that's what I just wanted to ex ex explain. Uh, first of all, let me just say that um, those of you who are members of parliament who are ministers, can you please prompt the ministers to take a final vote in cabinet on the five regional seats? We just need a final vote in terms of overcoming those two conditions that they, they included in the institution. So if you can ring, if you can talk to your uh, members of parliament who are ministers, then they can prompt it in the next meeting and then we can quickly take a vote. Now, we have the, when you look at the constitutional framework, section 101, that's where, the, where it talks about the membership of parliament. That only requires 56 votes. So really, we don't need 70, 83 votes to change that law, uh, that section of the Constitution. So I'm pretty sure that the government can easily muscle the numbers to vote for the change to Section 101. So we replace the 24 seats with five. What we need at this moment is to get the ministers to agree to uh, that decision going forward. As Alphonse said, uh, at the bureaucratic level, we are all set. We've got even draft. Uh, draft amendment to section 101 
Uh, we are also working on a draft bill to implement uh, debt change, but it cannot move unless the cabinet makes a final decision and say yes. Uh, we now can have five uh, regional seats in the coming elections. So that's all that I would like to appeal to our listeners out there, our friends out there, our women out there. Please uh, talk to your, um, your members or your relatives, uh, your friends who are ministers in cabinet to get the decision done. The prime minister is supportive. The prime minister is the one that is pushing for the five regional seats. We just need the support of the rest of the members of cabinet to get it across the line. Thank you, Dr. Kwa. Um, I'll just reiterate that very important point that there are two conditions that have to be met. That is that the executive government uh, in cabinet has to, the, the bill has to actually be sponsored in cabinet, in National Executive Council, and then be brought to the floor of parliament where 56 is the number, a simple majority is required to pass um, and, and on all the readings of, of the, those important bills. Um, Mayor, do you have final thoughts? Um, I uh, agree with uh, both uh, Dr. Kwar and uh, Dr. Gelu. We would like the national government, uh, our leaders, uh, parliamentary leaders in there to go behind the TSM and have uh, a fair representation of women in the floor of parliament for uh, Papua New Guinea. And for the women, um, we need to start, as soon as the election's over, we need to start. We need to be visible, just like Dr. Gelu said. We need to be visible. We need to keep on advocating. We need to keep on working until the next elections come. What we're doing now is where, as soon as the elections are gone, we're not, we, we just sit back and relax until the next elections are on their way, and then we start to pick up like one year, 12 months prior to the elections, and that is just not good enough. So we have to start from the word go. As soon as it's off, we're on the move again. And um, with the, the recent elections, I believe the only woman candidate came out very, very late, and that is the reason why, although she's well known among the professional elites, but she was not known within the, um, may, she may not have been known very well within the villages and within the uh, rural areas. That is the reason why she um, was not elected in. But otherwise, we can make it happen. And if we put our hands together, together working with the political leaders of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Wantok um, Blomiblalo, Solomon Islands. Samantha, do you have some final um, observations, please? Samantha, I think you might have to unmute, please. Just to say, in terms of uh, we have we have um, three women currently in our national parliament. I guess it would be it would be sorry for it would be good to see the research going into how they are able to you know utilize the capital that they already have from the husbands literally to to able to win these elections. Um, one of them, as we've spoken earlier about the level playing field, one of them really, you know, campaigned as a man, yeah? Um, Teresa, I'm just recalling your your research. Um, but also to say, um, I think effective partnerships can make things go a long way. So uh, for our sake here, we have been really able to utilize all the partnerships that we can exhaust to be honest. Um, just to make sure that the messaging goes out to a wide people as possible. But then again, there's an, another advocacy tool that we have tried, and that is color coding all our MPs, <laughs> um, you know, in traffic um, lights order, and then uh, pairing them up with us, and then, you know, talking to them individually uh, about TSM um, as, a, as a policy change that, you know, literally most people out of we have done a research so we have actually conducted a research last year and this is it and out from this research it is already clear that most people want women to be in uh, the political decision making space thank you samantha uh, teresa please any final thoughts 
Um, yeah, just a final thought. Uh, I'd just like to commend our women candidates. Um, elections are coming up, and I'm always impressed by the number of women who turn up to contest and put their hand up despite the, you know, all the challenges that come to them. And just one observation is that um, in 92, we had um, 16. Then in 97, we had 48. And 2012, we had 135. And then the last election, we had 167 officially, but then when we cleaned up the records, it was up to 179. So a lot of these um, big jumps in the number has been because there were a lot of awareness and trainings and workshops. So even if it's just political parties or about the electoral law or candidate training, all of that is necessary because there's always new women coming up. So I'd like to just encourage that. And um, um, the other thing too, is that in the 2017 election, we found that the women who were endorsed actually performed better and were placed higher than their independent um, counterparts. So even if our women are doing the best they can and we just um, have to help the structures and the institutions that they work in. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. So just to round things off, I think the important messages that have come through from uh, this morning's panel discussion are really around the importance of uh, awareness. Uh, the, the very significantly, Dr. Kwa uh, spoke to the issue of, of gaining, continuing the momentum that's already there um, with, the, with the highest level of political will by a Prime Minister who is very eager to see that uh, there are five uh, regional seats in the upcoming uh, elections. Uh, the, the details around the importance of, of what is required by our in our legislature, and, the, and that is 56 votes to pass the bills, um, and what is expected of our executive government in order for cabinet to make the decision, to sponsor the submission, and to make sure that, that the arms of government are in agreement. We've heard from the, the bureauc bureaucracy, our most senior, our attorney general, who's given us the, the insight into that. Um, and very importantly, the cultural barriers that we're going to continue to face. Well, you know, whether we're a matrilineal society or a patrilineal society, society, the dominant experience for us in Papua New Guinea uh, is that, and we've heard the historic insight from a, from a PhD researcher, that the, the, the numbers tend to peak and trough. And, and awareness is key, as we've heard from uh, the Solomon Islands experience, who are not very different to us in, in, in Melanesia in terms of uh, the enabling environment and the, and the frameworks within which the cultural uh, barriers and the frameworks within which we operate. So thank you, everyone, uh, today. I hope I haven't missed any other significant points. Um, and, and thank you for the online participants and thank you to the panellists. Thank you.